All right, let's turn now to actually uh, Romans 14, Feast and Fast and Food, oh my. And I record, I, um, I, <laughs> what do I say? I tried to record a show last week. It didn't record. And so those of my live internet class um, would have to forgive me for the bit of repetition because I need to do this part over again because it did not record and I need the, my YouTube audience to be able to see this. So just sit tight. Those of you with me live internet class, this is going to be a little bit of a repeat. What we talked about last week, which I'm going to talk about again this week, is we're ready to move down into some more of the verses of Romans chapter 14. And as I've said over and over again, when we're reading through this part of the Bible, we need to pay, pay very close attention to the context and the details. And so what I'm going to do for us tonight is um, I'm going to read uh, down through the little outline that I have for you that you can see on my screen. I'll read these bullet points again. But at the same time, I'm just going to read Romans 14 itself as the whole chapter. And it shouldn't take very long. This part of my study will only take maybe 10 minutes maybe 15 at the most, because I'm not going to stop in commentary. Comment. I just need to get an overview of where the study is going. What we're going to be doing as we're going through Romans 14, from my perspective, is we're going to go verse by verse, and I've broken the verses up into little sections or bullet points to capture my own um, uh, thoughts as conveyed by this particular little section. makes it a little easier to, to break it off into these little chunks. This is not according to any particular Bible study outline that, I've fo- that I'm following. I just did this on, of my own. This is my own way of looking at this chapter. So, um, looking at my screen right now, uh, you can see that I've got these bullet points. Let me see how many there are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight bullet points that are kind of um, outlining the general overview of the passage as I'm seeing it. So let me read the bullet point and then I'll read the section that's related to that and then um, that'll basically uh, form the study for tonight. In the first bullet point, which covers verse 1, the question is going to be asked, who are the weak in faith? And verse 1, as you can see here, says, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. And as I said, in time, we're going to just keep working our way through English, Greek, and looking at the context and figure out why this passage is important to us as first century, I'm sorry, as 21st century uh, believers. The second bullet point question is, which is going to cover verses uh, 2 and 2 through 4, the question is going to be, These are my questions, by the way. What is the contrast between anything and vegetables? And next week, we're actually going to start right there because we've actually already covered all of who are the weak in faith. Let me just stop for a moment and let you know that according to my understanding of this passage, we either have the weak in faith as Christians, in other words, brothers, like Paul calls them in in other parts of his letters, brothers. They're either Christians, but they're weak because they're still holding on to certain parts of the law as believers. This would put them primarily in the picture of being Jewish Christians from the traditional Christian perspective. So weak in faith refers to their weakness for keeping Torah even as a Christian. Perhaps they're baby Christians, perhaps they're just so used to their Judaic way of life that it's natural for them to keep Torah and espouse faith in Jesus. Either way you slice it, there's the assumption that as a weak Christian that they're expected to grow in their walk with Christ and eventually abandon the Torah or abandon the ceremonial civil parts of it so that they can express a freedom in Christ as a strong Christian, as opposed to being weak, and their strength will be expressed in their freedom to do whatever the Spirit's leading them to do, led by the Spirit instead of led by the law. Not under the law of Moses, but under the law of Christ, that type of change and switch. And so um, that's the traditional Christian perspective on the identity of who the weak are in faith. I disagree with that perspective. I think when Paul says weak in faith, why we have the Greek, um, astenunta te piste, I think he's referring to a weakness that's tied to uh, their confession of Jesus as the Messiah. So their faith in God is strong, it's established, it's vocal, it's publicly known, and their loyalty to God's Torah as a people group is strong, it's vocal, it's publicly known, but their affirmation of Jesus as the Messiah that they read about in the scriptures is not yet strong or vocal. It's not publicly known. So they're still kind of deliberating. Is Jesus the Messiah that we read about in our Tanakh? Is he the Messiah that we've been long uh, we've been long waiting for? Is he the one that was promised by the prophets? And et cetera, et cetera. So the weakness is attached to their 
not yet confessing Jesus as, as Messiah yet. But in my understanding of the passage, Paul still recognizes them as valuable, these non-Jewish Christians, as valuable components of the greater uh, faith community that he recognized in his day. This is something that was more would have been more uh, uh, relevant in his day than it is perhaps today because of the um, distance between uh, non-Messianic Judaism and, say, Christianity today, the parting of the ways between church and synagogue. But back in Paul's day, we didn't have the break between church and synagogue just yet. So Paul could recognize a greater... Uh, Hebrew community, Israel community, Jewish community that expressed a monotheistic faith in God and a loyalty to Torah, but was still um, trying to decide whether Jesus was the one. Did he fit the bill? Did he fit the promises? Were the prophecies about him or not? They weren't hostile to the gospel. This is a very important point. They weren't hostile, but they weren't decided yet. And I think this fits the context of who Paul's talking about when he talks about weak in faith, especially because Paul says that we're supposed to welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. So that's, in my opinion, a better way to read the passage. I don't expect you to take my opinion right away or be convinced of it. Um, it takes a little while to read through it and, and come to that conclusion, but that's what we're working through. So, uh, verses 1 and 2, as I mentioned, I'm sorry, t- uh, 2 through 4, uh, read, One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. 3 says, Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Verse 4 says, Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So, what is the contrast between anything and vegetables? Is it that the strong believe they can eat anything, including pork, shellfish, ham, you know, shrimp, lobster, octopus, cockroach, mouse, camel, elephant, anything? Does anything really mean anything when we're talking about a one person believes he may eat, may eat, eat anything, right? What do we mean by anything? Or is it really a contrast per se between all foods that the Torah describes as kosher, right? All meats that have already been uh, selected by God as uh, with uh, able to be eaten versus maybe a strictly vegetarian or vegan type diet. Is that the contrast? So those are some of the topics that we're going to look at when we get to that part in time. As I mentioned, uh, according to the schedule that I'm following, we should be able to hit that next week. Okay. The um, third bullet point, which covers verses five through nine is, are Christians free to worship God any day of the week? This becomes one of the central questions of debate between many uh, Christians who read through this passage who feel that, uh, and you're going to see here when we start reading the the, um, uh, the verses, that Paul is actually making an ex- a license for a debate between Saturday, Sabbath versus Sunday. I believe it's a bit too early historically to have that type of debate myself, but let's see what the verses say. In verse 5, Paul says, One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike, and each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. It sounds like on the surface that Paul's saying, we've got the Jews over here who are weak in faith, they're Christians, but they're still holding on to their Judaism, and so they esteem Sabbath. And then we've got the Gentiles over here who are strong in their faith uh, because they're not holding on to Torah. They believe in Jesus like the weak Christian Jews, but they're strong in that they're not tied down to the need, that they don't feel this compunction to follow after the Hebraic lifestyle. Thus, they're strong. And so they prefer Sunday worship as their day, or they prefer any day, right? Any day can be, because all days are esteemed alike. So therefore, I, Paul, who was one of the strong, read chapter 15, verse 1, I, Paul, who was one of the strong, recommend that you guys shouldn't quarrel with one another. Let just everyone have their own opinion. Let each person be fully convinced, but we've got this equality, right? Sabbath versus Sunday, they're both special days. You know, let's all just get along. That seems to be the general consensus of the uh, perspective on this passage. But again, I disagree uh, with the uh, popular opinion of today. Um, and when we get t- when we have time, we're going to look at why I disagree with that. Verse 6, and so let's see, it goes through verse 9. Verse 6 says, The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. And we're going to find when we get to the Greek, there's some um, variants there, as we can see by these hard brackets. We'll talk about that in time. Uh, Verse 7 says, For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. Verse 8, For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. And then verse 9 says, 
For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. And so that's going to be the section that we talk about when we get, when we get to it in time. Uh, the next bullet point covers verses 10 through 13, where and this is kind of linked to verse 1. Who exactly is the brother? Is it a believer? Or can it be the larger faith community of brothers that Paul would recognize as his fellow Israelites, right? Brother Israel. Brother Israelite, whether they were a believer or not. And so it covers verses 10 through 13. Uh, verse 10 reads, sorry about that. Uh, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Right, The Greek uh, word here is Adelphon. Um, and it's in the nominative case, as we can see by the uh, the last two letters. Oh, in. So it's a noun in the nominative, non- nominative case, meaning it's the subject. Why do you pass uh, judgment on your brother? Um, I'm sorry, not the nom- not the subject. It's actually the uh, the, the object. Uh, the, the the in this case, um, is that correct? A M S. Yeah, I think so. Uh, it's in the accusative case. That's, I'm sorry. It's the it's the A, the accusative. But the the ending tells us that. Uh, why do you pass judgment on your brother, or why do you despise your brother? Same word, same case here in the uh, the accusative case here. Um, why are you judging these people? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God, he says in verse 10. We'll look at that in time. Uh, what do I say? It's verses 10 through 13. Verse 11, For as it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess before God. And then verse 12, So each of us will give account of himself to God. And then verse 13, Paul gives kind of a semi-conclusion. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. And this time it's uh, in a different case. It's in the dative case, uh, Adelpho there. But it's the same Greek render, the same Greek um, um, Strong's number, which is Strong's number 80, Adelphos or Adelphon. The Greek changes um, endings depending on the case, the last letter or the last few letters of the word. But it's the same Greek word, so you understand. All right, uh, the next bullet point covering verses 14 through 18 reads, um, well, the question is, what exactly does nothing is in clean in itself imply? This is an interesting question because it it forces us into asking and examining the idea of whether or not Paul really did abandon his understanding of Mosaic legislation. In other words, it's no secret that the law in in the book of Leviticus outlines to the people of Israel, these are the foods that are clean, these are the foods that are unclean. The foods that are clean, you can eat. The foods that are unclean, don't eat them. And yet, if Paul comes along and says, nothing is in clean and of itself, then is he is he uprooting the legislation of Moshe? Is he challenging what Moses said? Is he actually directly contradicting the words of God? Let's look at the verses, 14 through 18. Paul says, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean and of itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. I mean, even at face level, surface level, face value, the logic of supposing that Paul is teaching that Jesus taught him that everything is relative when it comes to clean and unclean doesn't make any sense because suddenly we've got uh, an individual interpretation if it's unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. As if a person is going to actually um, dis, uh, dispute what the master himself is teaching us. So Yeshua taught Paul that nothing is unclean and of itself. So Paul thinks nothing's unclean and of itself. But now we've got the opinion of a, of, a, of a follower of Jesus who says, no, 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 master, it actually is unclean because I think it's unclean. In other words, it's almost as if Paul is almost as if we've got all of these opinions that are uh, competing. We've got Moses speaking God's words that says this is clean and this is unclean. And then we've got Paul come along under the authority of Jesus saying, no, 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 what Moses said and what God said is not really accurate. It's not really that A and B are clean and unclean respectively. It's actually that Jesus taught me that nothing's unclean of itself. Then we have another person entering into the discussion saying, no, 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 everybody's wrong. Everybody's wrong. God's wrong. Moses is wrong. Paul's wrong. Jesus is wrong. What really matters is what I think. What really matters is my own opinion because I think it's unclean, right? Anyone who thinks it's unclean. So this is a really valuable argument for us to have um, during these uh, discussions between Jews and Gentiles. Let's just keep reading through the rest of the um, the section. For if your brother, there's our Greek word Adelphos again, this time is actually in the subjective uh, genitive, right? It's it's a nominative case because I can, I can tell because of the last two letters that are Delphos. Um, but it's the same as the other words, right? Uh, same Greek, uh, same Strong's rendering number 80. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love, but what you 
eat, do not destroy for the one whom the the one destroy the one for whom Christ died. Um, verse uh, sixteen. Uh, let's see how far did it go through eighteen. Uh, so do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. Right? We're gonna have to talk about what do you mean by uh, this is good. Is it good that we can eat anything? Is it good that we're part of Israel? Is it good that we're saved? What does he mean by good there? Uh, in verse seventeen, Paul says. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And then uh, the final Posic verse 18, whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So we'll look at all that in time. And then uh, the uh, uh, third from the last bullet point, how can we make for peace and mutual upbuilding? Of course, we're, we have these two people groups, Jews and Gentiles, believers and unbelievers, that are coming together in this discussion, in this community. Paul's trying to help us work things out with one another. And he says in verse 19, Lynn, uh, let us pursue for what makes peace and for peace and for mutual upbuilding. So no matter how we slice it and dice it, at the end of the day, we've got to be able to come together and work out the differences. We're not going to compromise. We are not compromising on truth. If if Jesus is Messiah, and he is, if Jesus is Lord, and he is, then we don't compromise on that truth. Um, by the same vein, if the Torah is God's established word to mankind, to Israel first and then to the surrounding nations, and it is, then we don't compromise on the truths of God's word either. So this is going to be a valuable discussion for us in time as well. Uh, and that'll be just that single verse where we talk about that. And then continuing down into the questions, we're almost done here. In verse 20 and 21, what does everything is indeed clean mean? This is going to be similar to uh, verses 14 through 18 above. It'll probably just be a conclusion um, to that particular discussion, so it won't take very long. But Paul says, again, he returns to this topic of food. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean. Again, this phrase, everything is indeed clean, we're going to have to look at this. We'll look at the Greek, and we'll look at the, the underlying Hebrew and things like that, and see if we can get into the mind of Paul and figure out what the theology is behind his phrase, everything is indeed clean. And he says, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. I like that word stumble because it reminds me of what he talked about in earlier in chapter 11 about a national Israel stumbling over the stone of Messiah and over the offense of Gentiles being brought into Israel without having to change their ethnic status into Jewishness. So uh, he continues in verse 21 by saying, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. This brings up a valuable theological question of whether or not Gentiles, even if they don't agree that the kosher laws are relevant for them, Shouldn't they, in fact, um, appease or adopt or be considerate of the opinions of the Jewish people in the community, the weak in faith, uh, when, it caught, when it comes to eating that which seems to be acceptable to Gentile Christians? Would Jewish people be offended by eating by uh, Gentile Christians eating non-kosher food and yet still calling themselves um say, members of God's household, right? House, members of the family of God, Israelites, covenant members, things like that. I think we can get a lot of uh, discussion out of that particular part of the chapter. And then lastly, my last question, this will be this will finish out tonight's part of segment one for Romans 14. The question is asked, how do we keep the faith we have between ourselves and God? And this is a very strange question at the surface level. Again, covering verses 22 and 23. Paul says in verse 22, the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Who's he talking to? Is he talking to the Gentile Christians that that they have this faith in God and that they should keep it between themselves and God? Aren't they supposed to be witnessing to other people? Shouldn't they be sharing the good news of Messiah with Jew and Gentile alike? Right? What does he mean? Keep your faith between yourself. And then he goes on later in the rest of the verse to say, blessed is one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. Right? So we're going to have to talk about what this passage means. He certainly can't mean do not share your faith with others. That 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 disagrees with the rest of the apostolic scriptures and the message of the Bible as a whole, that we're supposed to share the good news of God's salvation with people that we meet. So we've got to understand what this passage means from the context and of this verse. And then the last verse in the whole chapter says, but whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats. Again, the topic comes back to food. Notice it doesn't say he has doubts, he's condemned if he doesn't believe in Jesus or something like that. It talks about food. He's condemned if he eats because the eating is not from 
faith, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. This is going to bring us back full circle to what I believe is one of the central topics of the entire passage as a whole, and that is food and table fellowship and things related to um, covenant membership and viewing the other person across the table from you uh, through the lens of the table fellowship and the shared um, uh, community uh, dynamics that are expressed between Jews and Gentiles who've come together, been thrust together, uh, both expressing a monotheistic belief in God and some of them expressing a belief in Jesus as Messiah, others not, some of them expressing a loyalty to Torah and others not, and all of the social dynamics that are at play between these two groups. Okay? We'll get to all that in time. All right, let's turn now to exploring the Shema, discussions on the issues of Trinity. We've got 20 minutes left in the study as I'm looking at my little timer here. 